All right. Good afternoon for uh, I think most of you. I'm I'm out of the U.S., so that's the context I'm I'm reaching out to y'all from. Um, and yes, our talk today is about playing with Metasploit, and then it it tails into playing with ideas in clowning. So. The premise for today is that learning through play helps us experiment and, and understand concepts and tools on new levels. And I, I'm I'm giving that quote to a wise Furby. Um, this is actually a picture from a previous talk of mine that I did. Uh, the, I was, uh, I've had the honor of speaking at, at OSCON, which was an open source conference put out by O'Reilly. I got to do that twice. And Furby's uh, figured prominently in that talk. Uh, my construct has always been never sign up to give a talk that isn't something that you want to play with personally. You're going to spend a good bit of time putting something together and it might as well be fun. Um, you see the image up in the upper left hand. That's, of course, my my serious uh, headshot that shows up on my LinkedIn profile. I'm a software engineer by trade. Um, I'm old enough to have been doing it long enough to have some tools in my history that I, I never put on my resume anymore. Uh, a previous job actually had me as the cyber technical director for a company that was, um, they were a government contractor that was interested in using their skills in software development and system engineering in more of the cyberspace. So, so I don't come to you today as someone who is a penetration tester or someone who does audits. I'm a software geek who applies those skills in the cyber realm. And specifically because of the roles I've had in the past, I've often thought about, well, how can I help share the information I've gained in, in a way that's engaging? Um, this talk actually, beginnings of it were given at something called, you see me mention UMBC CWIT, that's the, the Center for Women in Technology at uh, my local university, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, they have this wonderful program to to bring women uh, with support into technical realms, uh, software engineering being one, cyber also being a big concern. And so this talk originally started with a briefing to them about Metasploit and what it is. And then of course, the picture in the lower right-hand corner is in a, another persona of me. I think um, in life, we should have multiple aspects of ourselves that we get to develop. And that we'll talk about later in the chat. Uh, that is Clementine. Um, rather than Tina. All right. So Metasploit, and again, the, the premise of Pancakes Con is that we're all coming with differing levels of, of backgrounds and may have been exposed to different tools. Metasploit, uh, many of you have heard of, we're going to talk a little bit about how it's built out and what you can learn from it. But to give you some context, it cites itself, or Wikipedia does that on its path, as the world's most used penetration testing framework. It's open source. Um, they, the company that now owns it also provides some commercial versions of the tool. It was originally developed by a security researcher, and then it was procured by Rapid7. They now um, sustain its open source uh, development. They've got an expanding ecosystem of exploits, what they call exploits, payloads, and auxiliary modules. Those are three different aspects in their world. An exploit is something that is actually going to get you onto the box. A payload is something that's going to let you then uh, gain control of the box once you're on it. And then auxiliary modules are things like scanners and fuzzers and other things that help you gain information about the system, but don't actually specifically uh, participate in the exploit itself. The exploits that they have target platforms, including Windows, Linux, Android, Cisco, JavaScript, I mean, you name it, they've got a, a means of going after it. Um, and at my last check, there were something like 2,047 exploits and another 500 or so uh, payloads or auxiliary modules out there. So there's a lot of things out there. And in fact, that becomes a challenge to figure out what to use, uh, how to decide what to use a, across a particular system. Um, some things you can do to keep track of what they're releasing. They have an excellent YouTube channel, the Metasploit Demos channel, um, that gives them a chance to demonstrate new capabilities coming or new exploits available. Um, they also have an active blog. Their weekly wrap-ups blog posts tell you what's come out um, in the week so that you can basically upload or update 
in your local um, installation. Then, of course, and we're going to speak to this a little bit further, they are open to contributions. It's an open source project uh, with a very friendly licensed framework, and they've got some pretty clear contributor guidance available. All right. So, again, to get anybody who isn't already using this started, there's a couple of ways to easily stand this up. You can install it in a virtual machine, and in fact, um, you can do that as a as a baseline installation. Um, you can install an additional hackable. They they give you a, a what's called Metasploitable, a machine that allows you to target against it to run your exploit, so that you don't have to uh, try something out necessarily on a random machine. And then for those of you who are using Kali Linux or Parrot OS, it comes pre-installed as uh, part of both of those platforms. So, and again. I was advising uh, young college students in my first incarnation of this talk, a, a little bit of user beware. Um, there, there are constructs for any penetration tool that you need to take into account um, to consider when you're using it in your own network, pay attention to what you're doing and what you have uh, accessible to it. You're running open source code. This is particularly important in the cybersecurity realm, but in any realm, actually. Uh, consider using it against virtual machines or use it in CTFs. Uh, but don't use it against other computers for which you don't have pretty explicit permission, like written permission, keep you out of jail permission. Um, I know we're coming from different places around the world to this conference, and so the the legal frameworks work differently, um, but it's, it's pretty well known that you should uh, make sure you have written permission before you're using these kinds of things against machines. I did do... Um, because I assumed this was going to be a, a group with a, a base of a variety of skill levels in here. I did take a quick look to see how this would be useful for those of you who are um, considering various certifications. I was interested, so the, the two certifications that came to mind to specifically do a cross check against were the pen test plus. You can, at, at my check, you should check yourself. Um, you can use Metasploit and its, its exploits for the Pentest Plus uh, test. I also checked the OSCP test, and they have, you get to use it once against one machine, one exploit. So pick very carefully. Um, after that, you can no longer use uh, Metasploit against in your, in your testing infrastructure. What we're going to talk about here, though, lets you look at the code very practically. Remember, I'm a software engineer um, for Metasploit and its various attacks and would let you then be advised by that and learn from that in, in the context where you're looking to figure out how to launch an attack using something that's, that's not Metasploit, but you sure can be advised by the code. So let's see how this toggle back and forth between my virtual box, virtual machine is going to work here versus there. So I mentioned I've, I've got my MSF console up. The simplest thing to do is to tell it to show me the exploits. And as of my last update, it tells me I've got 2,263 exploits on the machine uh, to work with. That's a little bit more than I'd like to, to tackle at any particular time. So we're going to take advantage of some of the search capabilities in um, Metasploit to narrow that down, right? So um, in my case, I am doing development against uh, spring cloud stream capabilities in, in my work life. So you're going to see me swap, and unfortunately, this is going to um, scroll our, our presentation down slightly as I toggle to another window and then toggle back to the presentation. Come on. Here we go. So I want to go out to, so first the Metasploit site to let you see what that looks like and then see the download link. Now I'm going to go out to the CVE list and I am going to search the CVE list for uh, Spring Cloud because that's what I specifically care about. And I get back 18 CVE records. Now, in my context, I particularly care about um, Spring Cloud function. 
I'm using that in my day-to-day -day job. So I'm going to take a look at this particular CVE. Uh, let's see, that was 22,979 at a, C, at a year 2022. Get um, Metasploit to look for specific, for that specific um, version. And it does not find it, unfortunately. But I can then say, give me other capabilities that you can specifically attack. Is there something else that I can work through? And, and it is kind enough to tell me that someone has contributed a um, Spring Cloud function injection attack that from Metasploit's perspective is going to hit against multiple architectures, not just Linux, Windows, Android, multiple architectures, which makes sense. So it's a web application framework um, and also across the HTTP payload. So this is all working out very nicely. Um, I can ask Metasploit to give me information about that particular exploit. And it is kind enough, and, and for many of these, it is kind enough to give me the specific NIST vulnerability description. Um, a, in some cases, you'll get a zero day proof of concept uh, demonstration. Someone had written something up that is not specifically a Metasploit module, but you've got that code to work with as well and other descriptors as well. I've seen blog posts and announcements of the vulnerabilities. The folks who are submitting these uh, exploits do a great job of giving the documentation and uh, associated with this. To the further point, you can actually tell it, um, give full information. Let's see, come on. Ah, I haven't told it to use it. All right, so use zero info dash D, generating the documentation, and then it'll give you a, a, a much fuller picture of how to verify the challenge, um, how to execute the, the module, how to run the exploit. And you'll get to see that in action before you attempt to execute it on the machine. So that's all helpful. But again, I'm receiving someone's specific code rather than getting to learn from it myself. So what we're going to do instead, we're going to go back to our console here. And I'm going to exit out of Metasploit. What we're going to then do is take a look at the code There we go, Metasploit framework. This is what's laying out on your machine. This is what's actually running. In my case, I'm running MSF console. You see that in the binary set here. This module set, if you look inside of it, is the exploits themselves. So that was the multi HTTP. Come on. Oh, exploits, modules. Ah. There we go. So the code that it's actually running is sitting here on your machine. What I specifically cared about was this one. Right, so we're now looking at the code that provided the metadata that we saw back from Metasploit. And then the code that, in fact, there's a what's called a check module. Is this exploit likely to succeed? And then finally, the exploit itself. Execute the exploit, uh, attach the payload across to the machine, and return back a, a response of whether it was successful or not. For me, as a software geek, this was the most interesting part, right? Looking through a set of, of exploits, um, I understand the techniques at a general level, but give me code to play with, and I become much more powerful as someone who can then uh, alter the attack for a particular machine. 
um, who can uh, apply these ideas into a new attack and take things forward. Now, the context, what you're looking at here is Ruby code, and that is not a language that um, I am as familiar with. I have done some things in the past um, with Ruby, and at one point I was doing some extensions of uh, GitLab. But the ability to, to take a look at the code itself is, is a lot more powerful than, so what you're, what you're seeing, this is what was actually in the GitHub repo. All of that is specifically then laid out directly on your box. So that same exploit, HTTP, scroll down through the long set. That, that code I was looking at on my box is exactly the same thing you're seeing in the GitHub repo. That's an, an additional bit of useful information from the context of if I want to play with that module and want to add some additional debugging information, want to add some additional log information to see very practically what the payload comes back as or what the traffic across looks like, I can um, add some Ruby code to add some log information and execute it on my box. And, and I can do that very directly by changing the file on my own file system. Nothing like, like I said, I'm I'm a player. I'm an experimenter. The, these are the kinds of things that I want to get hands on and in and do. All right. So we we took a look at that very uh, practically as I walked down through that particular exploit. The for a Ruby module, it has a very specific structure. And the initialize block is going to give information to Metasploit so that it can convey that, it can search across it, it can, um, uh, you have what arguments it needs to offer the end user to then set the target host or the, um, the local host or um, uh, anything else, the number of threads, uh, there's, there's quite a variety in the set of parameters that Metasploit might need for a particular um, exploit. This uh, allows it an infrastructure that we can we can see consistently. Then that check method that is not a required method actually, um, and there's some things you can do to tag an exploit to say whether it has a check flag. Um, there's the concept of a rating on a managed exploit module, and one of the things it rates is whether or not the exploit can be uh, has a robust check method so that. If you check against it, you're pretty darn sure that this exploit is going to succeed. Can it? Is there something that the um, exploit can interrogate about the remote machine? Does it return a particular error code? Does it um, have something in its banner that allows it to say, yes, the, the exploit that we're executing here, or about to execute here, is, is likely to succeed? And then finally, the exploit method execute the payload on the machine, something that's going to set up a, a shell is usually your um, the intended effect, and gain access so that you can then do additional things to that machine or pivot to other machines. All very handy, and across the 2,000 or so exploits, um, a, a wealth of information. Uh, again, my particular vector for today's talk was to look through the, the spring path. Um, I get CVEs that scanners, code scanners, come up with and say um, that uh, our various libraries or are subject to CVEs. This gives me a way when there's already an exploit written to see what that means, um, what the and have a conversation with the security person and our team to to demonstrate. Well, we'll know this particular path is accessible or is not accessible. Should you give me an exemption? Should you not give me an exemption? Or um, are there ways? In certain cases, um, we can't upgrade a library of Spring. Uh, for example, Spring's about to release or has released Spring 6, but not all of the corollary things in its ecosystem are, are in play with that. Not all of our systems can as yet run the, the version of Java that that needs. This gives me another way to then say, um, well, are there things that... Um, I can set up to minimize the risk of that particular CVE being triggered. Can I um, protect that particular endpoint? Can I can I do some other things? 
all useful both as a security researcher or um, quasi researcher in my in my case and as a software engineer who's seeking to better understand the problem. So that was the, the majority of their modules are, are Ruby modules that follow this structure, the initialize, the check, and the exploit. And then if you go to find, and, and I'll show you some paths to do that in just a minute, other modules that aren't in the uh, Metasploit code base, these are, these are things you can look for. Can I find examples of code that are Ruby that have, that reference Metasploit because it's going to make use of the Metasploit libraries and, and use these particular words in them? to give me access to other potential um, exemplars. Now, this section here in terms of external modules, um, this was what really got me excited about giving this talk. There was a blog post on Rapid7 in their Hacksmith series where they were talking about what they called external modules. And, and by that, they meant that the process, the, when the module executed, it was going to execute in a process space external to MSF console. When we've been running exploits within Metasploit, within the console, all of those are within its process space. And they, at that point, I think it was in 2017, saw some advantages to being able to basically push that workload out to external processes. By the means they were doing that, was a communications via JSON and R JSON and RPC, remote procedure calls, which then let them interact with a number of other languages. Python and Golang were the two languages that they specifically had uh, set up some, some helper code for um, and had written some uh, guides for. So I start to walk through the code base looking for examples of these external modules. I, I look down through their um, documentation, and as much as I saw an advantage to exposing um, more avenues for folks to write code, right? There, there are books out there on, here's how you can do penetration testing using Python. Um, I believe I've seen one similar for going, how wire, uh, I should be seeing a number of modules coming through with those two languages in particular. They're, they're more popular languages uh, generally than, than Ruby. Ruby's um, was a very popular language at one point for certain tasks, and it's not one that, that we end up seeing, um, at least in the spaces with, within which I work very often. So on on my behalf and on your behalf, I reached out over Slack to the um, to the Metasploit team. Very helpful folks. I said, "This is what I saw in your in your documentation. Um, this capability sounds interesting. Why am I not seeing more exemplars of that?" And the the response I got back was that, "Well, they prefer that those modules be modules generally be written in Ruby." unless they offer functionality that Metasploit doesn't offer. And, and so that helps explain why I wasn't seeing as many of those, which um, does not preclude someone from writing an external module and putting it in the uh, code layout of Metasploit for their own purposes. Um, if, if you add a module under the infrastructure of Metasploit, it will get registered in, it is then executable, you can use it for your own purposes. The only context here is the suggestion that if you are looking to contribute that module back to Metasploit, and as um, engineers, um, there may be some distinct advantages to doing that, um, they would prefer that it be written in Ruby unless there's a reason not to. I give that caveat up front and, and say, uh, wow, I, I, I was looking forward to playing with that more. However, there are some examples, they've, they've got a pretty decent structure for building these out. They have received some modules of this sort, uh, both of Python. Uh, uh, actually, I did not find an example of, of Golang. I've seen examples of Python that have been received. The objective is you, you write your metadata slightly differently, and then um, you tell your module to, you provide a module run method. Right. To provide data back, you provide a you use their module log method. Um, these are using libraries provided by Metasploit so that they can make the RPC calls uh, hand off that exchange of information very neatly for you. I mentioned 
that um, you can use Metasploit modules that are not in Metasploit. That's the advantage of an interpreted language, Python, uh, Ruby, both are inter uh, interpreted languages. So you can find other Metasploit modules that are not checked into Metasploit. Um, the context, for example, I wanted to find additional Metasploit spring modules. And so um, it is very easy to then say, well, give me uh, give me things in GitHub. You do have to be logged in to GitHub to do this, where they reference Metasploit, reference spring, um, and do that in all GitHub. It says, I don't find any repositories matching that. Well, that's that's fine. No one's going to use that name for their repository, but I can find other exemplars of modules that folks have written that are not in Metasploit. So this is another potential way to um, learn from folks who are working with this framework, um, who have been kind enough to make their code visible, not, pri not private, but uh, have not, at least at this point, contributed those back. Um, you can see that this Brandon Perry person has done a few. Um, this spring cloud traversal, actually, that has been contributed to Metasploit. So you, um, and some of these folks looking, they've, they've uh, this is the same gentleman across the, the same repo. Um, so you'll get a mix of things where folks are potentially experimenting, potentially looking to contribute something back, um, or uh, in, in the case of this gentleman up here, um, have not done either of the, the two, and you can learn from the things that they're that their code demonstrates. Uh, I would make the same caveat that I made before about being particularly careful about using code very directly that you've received from someone's GitHub repo. It's not been, it's not gone through any sort of review. Um, the, the GitHub search you see here at the top is the language Ruby Metasploit Spring. That's going to get you Ruby modules probably done in the um, the primary way of receiving modules. And then the one below is looking for Python modules that are of the uh, exploit command stage or type. And I, I'd caveat, there are a lot of uh, example.py versions out there, and you may want to filter that out so that you're not reading the same code over and over. All right, so in playing with their code. You can you can learn a number of things by inspecting someone else's code, executing it locally, uh, potentially adding logging information or working with a debugger to, to get a sense of, of what's there and how things operate. I'll say beyond um, signing yourself up to give a talk where you have to dig in, be ready to answer questions, the, the best way to then learn may be very practically to, to look at um, submitting a module, contributing a module. Um, the team, as I said, I reached out via Slack to ask them a question and got back a response pretty quickly. Um, I had to remember that oftentimes in the open source world, you think of folks contributing things in the evening. Well, Rapid7 is, uh, is a company and many of their supporters are folks who work on in Boston at Rapid7. And so I, I couldn't expect to get a response until office hours that day, which was a little different than I'm used to in other projects, but they were very friendly and, and workable. Um, I have seen, this is another way of, of learning. This is how I started to recognize the external modules might not be where they were continuing to be, even though their documentation suggested this is a path. They gave feedback on their pull requests. It was very useful. I'm happy to learn from another developer as they're putting forth, uh, putting forth code. Someone had submitted a Python module and they had gotten back a response that suggested that maybe they should consider rewriting it in Ruby because there was a library in Metasploit that provided a capability that would be useful for them. That that kind of feedback. This is not a this is not a stale project. It's a great. Um, growth base to learn techniques and, and capabilities from. And then if you are um, less interested in being as directly visible, um, you can you can of course follow their weekly wrap ups, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to cite on your LinkedIn profile or your resume that you had contributed a module that folks are using in the Metasploit code base? Um, that team 
um, when I said that I was, when I asked my question and, and conveyed why I was, um, why I was asking it, that I was going to be giving this talk and was wanted to be clear about what I was ex explaining to folks about external modules. Um, they they were oh well if folks have any questions we're we're interested in talking with them we've we've got uh, a set of modules um, that we'd love to get folks to contribute things forward to they were a very open a very open group so uh, I'd uh, offer that context all right so let me take a pause um, and say from the perspective of a software geek seeking to learn and and share how they learned. Um, about some of the various attacks and exploits in Metasploit, are there folks who have questions before we go into the second part of the talk? Uh, this, this is Avi Maben, I'm the moderator, and I'm not seeing any questions in, uh, in the uh, track to Slack at this point, uh, but uh, if you uh, all share them, I, I can uh, kind of compile them towards the end as well, so that we okay. can, if okay. there are. Yeah, but there aren't any questions at this point. Okay, well, then we'll uh, slightly change appearance here and work through another way of learning through play that I particularly enjoy, um, and that is the clowning perspective of the talk. So I, I count clowning as sort of my, uh, my superhero identity um, with this is a very light clown look, but as we're going to talk about in this aspect here, the the idea of we talked about playing in the Metasploit code base, and now we're going to talk about playing through clowning and, and different kinds of experiences that can offer. All right. So the hat you can see, uh, the, the look you see is is at least one of the looks in the picture. It is one that uh, Clementine, my clown persona, has has used at a gig for whatever reason. I'm a particular fan of the color orange, um, and I had began clowning six or seven years ago, and I've had a number of conversations with folks who are at varying levels of clowning about what makes a clown. What what is it that um, helps folks become this? alternate persona that that folks have often described as sort of the the comic version of you the comic superhero version of you the the aspects of you that you keep hidden below that um in terms of your uh, ability to cause someone to laugh or to surprise them we'll see clowns in all kinds of places i i have the nose i have the shoes um, today I'm not wearing them, but I but I have the 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 clothes and experiment with with the makeup. That isn't what these are things that help folks recognize that someone is is um, interested in clowning or being a clown in a particular moment. But a clown, very practically, is an invitation to play. It's an invitation to play with ideas. It's an invitation to play with people. It's an an invitation to communicate with them in a new way. No game is too silly for a clown. The picture you're seeing up on the screen is actually um, what's called a clown alley. I uh, think of it as your, your meetup group for clowns. Um, in this particular case, we are at an event where we're um, performing for uh, adults who have uh, uh, developmental disabilities. They, some of them can't speak as well. They, they look at the world through a different lens than your typical adult. So we help them look at the, the world through lens of, of wanting to play and, and having fun with them. Um, we think that uh, interacting with a clown basically gives both the clown and the people that we're interacting with that permission to be silly and childlike and put aside your concerns for at least the period of the performance. This The picture here on the right is one that was taken actually last weekend. Um, when you're a clown, that that big nose, that big feet, and most importantly, your big smile gives you entrance to, in some cases, circuses. Our, our clown alley is looking forward to performing with a local traveling circus that's coming through our area in June. Uh, for those of us who grew up going to Ringling Brothers um, consistently, this is a chance to run away with a circus. And, and the things you can do is 
as a clown who isn't uh, tied to the full um, circus uh, lifestyle. You can participate in parades and, and meet with folks out on their front lawn who are out to see what the world is going to offer them today. Community events of various sorts. Um, I have clown friends who've been on uh, international outreach trips, um, whether that be going to war-torn areas and just entertaining kids and families and, and, and trying to help them have a moment of lightness in what is otherwise a pretty awful time in their life at the moment. Um, there are folks who who are, are reaching out to schools and are able to uh, to give information to students in a way that that resonates with them. This is something different than their teacher standing at the front of the room with a wah-wah voice. Um, it, in the same context, uh, uh, Clementine has uh, given a children's message in her church on regular intervals. It's, it's something where um, we help the kids and the adults see the message from a different light. Uh, I have friends who are who focus on visiting senior centers and again, bringing smiles to places that that just they need more of them. Um, that's that's kind of the world today or hospitals as well. So the, the aspect is life as a clown is the intent to be with folks and 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 help them uh, share a smile with you, with someone else at something funny you've done at something they think you might do. the skill set of a clown so the the picture you're seeing here i am juggling three clubs that's all i can do at the moment if you give me four i'm certain to do something tragic to either me or someone in the audience and in fact that was part of the bit i was doing at the particular time i have a, a strainer on my head to act as a kind of helmet and i've offered the the folks in the front row, the chance to wear it instead of me to protect them from the flying clubs. Um, you'll see clowns who are amazing at balloon twisting and, and doing particular balloon creations. Um, and that's part of their clown persona. Um, there are folks who, who concentrate on physical comedy, who can uh, who can take a fall, who can do um, uh, a slide, who can their, their uh, whole um, classes and techniques for how to handle certain certain physical comedy aspects. And then there's your traditional clown skits where a couple of clowns will work together and, and convey a clown idea. Usually these are classic bits that you might have seen on, for example, I Love Lucy in the past. These are now uh, translated into modern day use by clowns. How many magic is another? If I can, if I can cause a kid or an adult to smile by some simple trick, even better when the kid thinks that um, I'm about to do something magic and I make something else silly happen. Uh, that is, that is an aspect of a clown. Or unicycling, or I've seen folks do or origami or acrobatics. The point is, all of these are skills that be, can be uh, gained and and tried and and played with. And from the perspective of a clown, their their intent is to be done comically. If if I'm doing my juggling, um, I should be telling you something about how I can't do it, or um, or I've been I've been working to learn. Even though in in real life, I've spent hours in my backyard um, dropping clubs near my dog um, so that I can figure out how not to drop them in real life until I specifically intend that to happen. So how to get started? This is that same clown alley. Um, this was that St. Patrick's Day parade uh, up in, um, I, I live in, in Maryland. So this is the free state clown alley, a subset of us who were parading on that particular cold day. Um, the context I'd say is uh, seek out a clown alley. There are international clown groups. There's the World uh, Clown Association. They're actually, they have a convention going on right now in Florida that I wish I were at. There's some amazing clowns sharing skills and learning from each other and, and figuring out how to partner with each other. Or Clowns of America International, which is the group my uh, particular alley belongs to. Um, there are alleys that are all available strictly online as well. We know that there are some folks who live in areas where there's just not a clown alley nearby. There's not a way to get together as easily in person. And so online is, is what you got. Um, and so uh, that's an offering as well. You can attend a convention um, either regionally 
Uh, I'm a member of what's called the Mid-Atlantic Clown Association up and down the East Coast here in uh, the United States. Um, there are regional clown associations, I think. Uh, I know of not only ones in the US, but there are other ones in other areas of the world. Or you can attend one of the larger conventions led by WCA or Clowns of America International. Um, there's clown schools. There's been one. Uh, there's a former Ringling Brother clown, Priscilla Mooseberger, who runs a, a, a clown camp out in, I want to say it's Wisconsin. There are other clown camps. There's been one in Georgia for the last couple of years. This amazing opportunity to meet with people who their passion is in helping folks smile. And, and that is a, a pretty neat kind of group of people to be around, uh, to hang out with, to bounce ideas off of and just frankly to play, to play with. Uh, I met with one of the clowns from my alley over coffee yesterday. I was giving him back a speaker system he had loaned me for an event. Um, oh, uh, the the part that I don't have a slide here for, some of us get paid occasionally. It doesn't, it doesn't at all match what you can make in the software development industry, at least on the scale of clowning I'm doing. But, you know, make a couple hundred bucks on the weekend for doing balloon twisting or, or having fun with kids. Um, that's not a, a bad way to spend some time. Um, I had borrowed the speaker system from my friend and uh, we were uh, was returning it and we were talking about how we could get members of our alley together to do just basically a play session. Uh, we we hope to to pull some folks together at the end of this month into an open space and and experiment with different skills and see who can who can improve upon what they're doing or bring some new ideas to the team. So with that, um, that's what I generally look like in, in pretty skimmed down clown form. Um, the uh, rubber chickens have been upgraded. Uh, I have a whole clown room here in my basement filled with all kinds of crazy things. Um, and I thank you for spending time with me this morning and Hope that we've got some uh, some questions to work through. Yeah, we, we've got a couple of questions uh, that are in the Slack, and uh, if they're uh, as you're they're being answered, uh, feel free to add additional ones. Uh, so the first question was, how did you get into clowning? And what it, I guess the second part of the question from Diodinesis is, what is the strangest event that you've worked? Okay, so the. I got into clowning, I, I said, about seven or so years ago. Um, uh, I am a uh, I am a devout Christian, and so I had gone to a Christian retreat and um, I was talking with the other folks at my table about things that I thought would be neat ministries to start in churches. And um, our particular church has a mix of various ages, um, of various ability levels. We've got folks who... Uh, uh, do come from an adult disability perspective. Um, we've got young kids, we've got senior citizens. And I, and I thought, you know, I've seen clown troops out there that um, that do this kind of thing. I'd like to start one in my home church or participate in one of my, in my home church. And we could go visit the local senior centers and hospitals. I wasn't myself doing clowning at the time. I'd just seen some of this in action. And uh, my, my, the folks at my table basically challenged me to to tr to start somewhere. And so how I started was to come back and find my local clown alley. Uh, like I said, mine's, I'm in Maryland and I and I found that group. Um, I've since been exposed to clown alleys in, in other regions. They do a great job of helping folks uh, understand what they can do in clowning, build their skills, build their confidence, give them opportunities to go out to parades or to events and participate with other clowns and, and see what this might look like for them. And so um, I've, I've enjoyed every bit of it. My, uh, I, am, I am approaching, uh, I'll turn 49 this year in the US. You can't, there's a, there's a rule about taking money out of your 401k, what your, uh, your retirement savings. You can't touch anything really until you're 55. Um, so my my role right now is I'm, I'm having fun in software and then I'm building up my clown abilities and my business so that at 55, I can start doing that as, as my fun, my contribution to the world um, that hopefully at least covers 
uh, my expenses and and the things that I want to buy and play with and go to. <laughs> uh, a couple other questions because I know we're coming up on time uh, that are in the Slack. The uh, have you ever used your clown persona, Clementine, to teach or demonstrate IT or security concepts to folks that are not in either of those fields? From Taylor P. Yep. I strongly, I have not as yet. I strongly considered it. I was giving a talk on Kubernetes. And so the idea of juggling many things and having them show up in various places, I thought that would be a lot of fun to play with. Um, but I did not, in fact, do that that particular day. It would have been a great audience to do it with. It was my own company. Um, uh, we were we were training folks. I, I had the background in Kubernetes to, to give them that information, but didn't end up doing it that day. Just sort of mentioned it in passing that I could have. <laughs> uh, and I think the last question is uh, for the idea of playing in Metasploit or playing through Hobby. How did you approach picking up? Like, where did you start? Like. Uh, find a place to start with that. It, was it just a matter of an opportunity, or did he like seek that out? Um, from and that was from James Proctor. Okay, we're at time. <laughs> I will happily respond to questions ongoing in Slack. Then so I'm okay, thank you. Help anybody else.